Well, good day and welcome. I'm Adrian Stevens, co-convener of the Cochrane Rapid Reviews Methods Group. And I'll be spending the next few minutes looking at rapid reviews as an area of potential methodological development in Cochrane. And rapid reviews are not new in the realm of knowledge synthesis, with the early ones merging about 20 years ago, but they're gaining more prominence in use. And no universal definition exists for rapid reviews. And therefore, as a running definition, our convenership team has anchored them as a type of knowledge synthesis in which the standard systematic review methods are streamlined and processes accelerated to complete the review more quickly. In addition to a lack of definition, uh, Andrea Trico and colleagues have shown that variable terminology is used to identify rapid reviews, but rap the rapid review term itself is the most frequent. It may be helpful to consider how rapid reviews compare to other knowledge synthesis types to understand its distinctiveness. And those familiar with systematic reviews will recognize uh, the typical steps of conduct as shown down here to the left. And although living systematic reviews differ from traditional systematic reviews in continuously updating the literature to keep the evidence base current, a rapid review generally follows the systematic review process, but with opportunity to modify the process at one or more steps to quicken it. And I'll show a, a slide forthcoming that'll outline some examples of modifications and abbreviations. Now, rapid reviews may include systematic reviews and or primary studies. Um, and one sample estimates that about 50% of rapid reviews include secondary evidence like systematic reviews. So it's quite a few. Oh, and then further, one may decide uh, whether it's appropriate or time conducive to undertake a meta-analysis and certainly grade as possible. And I like the flexibility that grade provides in terms of criteria they outline to be able to state where the grade was used and providing caution in the interpretation of findings uh, is an aspect that's important to consider for rapid reviews. And this of course would differ from overviews uh, in that there may be potential commonality uh, with the inclusion of systematic reviews. Really the overview takes the systematic review process and does not employ shortcuts. Um, and then later when uh, looking at the literature would take a much deeper approach to exploring information in the available systematic reviews, um, looking at overlap, if there's overlap, et cetera, uh, including the potential to reanalyze and consult primary studies, which really isn't done. Um, in the context of a rapid review. And finally, the intent of scoping reviews is to map or characterize the literature um, landscape, but not really to synthesize it. And there can be overlap between rapid reviews and scoping reviews if the methods of the scoping review use some of those shortcuts, but otherwise how they handle the information to synthesize it is quite different. Now, I've not touched on protocols, but all to say that you know, all of them can use a protocol uh, with rapid reviews incorporating points at which decisions can be made on how to proceed, depending on the nature and the volume of the evidence encountered. Well, it's perhaps worth a brief note to highlight that Cochrane is undertaking work and has undertaken work to make uh, the Cochrane systematic review process itself more efficient, such as using artificial intelligence and developing platforms that can capitalize on efforts beyond that of what the systematic review team can do. And some of these may still be used in rapid reviews, but rapid review abbreviations and processes would still be a separate consideration to expedite the product. Now, very ar various articles exist about rapid reviews and the majority of them characterize or discuss rapid review methods and approaches. Um, some evaluate rapid review methods, either at specific steps of conduct or looking at the whole process, but there really is a need for more empirical evidence to inform the impact of abbreviated methods. Now it's this slide in the next um, that outlines some examples of modifications that can be used during the conduct of a rapid review. Um, the column to the right provides you with a sense of frequency here um, or support for its existence from available literature. And so let's take, for example, limiting uh, uh, literature search sources. So that's 
you know, one sort of method of abbreviation that can be used, um, but to show that really very few, and, and from this one method study, it was about 2%, only use one database. So they typically use more than one. Um, you could look at reducing or omitting uh, gray literature. And again, just to get a sense from what rapid reviews have done, you know, a good majority of them still use gray literature, but maybe they limit the sources that they look at. Um, for study selection, um, the team may consider to what extent a second person is involved, but just to show that very few only use one person at full text. So here, here's one estimate is around 11%. Um, similarly, with uh, data extraction, again, only 7% of rapid reviews have just used one person for extraction as well as appraisal. Um, and so, yeah, thinking about, you know, how you might employ a second person. Um, so, for example, using a verification process where you could check the first person's work for some or all of, of the studies, and that would be one way to use a second person. Um, very few rapid reviews uh, include meta-analyses. Um, so, for example, it's not always used in rapid reviews. And, and finally, when looking at grade, uh, one method stumpy study on what was a small sample found that of the 8% of rapid reviews that did use grade, um, the evidence profile was not used in a majority of them. Typically, multiple questions are not undertaken in a rapid review with the thinking that you really need to focus on what that key item of, of interest is for uh, the requester to be able to uh, produce a report for them to meet the timeline. And though a, a flexibility exists um, to address different types of questions when looking at uh, conducting a rapid review, questions of intervention effectiveness are the most commonly undertaken. And so this is a slide looking at the reporting of rapid reviews uh, against the PRISMA checklist. Um, and so if you, and this is called a radar plot. And so if you look at um, the image, what you see is um, for each item of PRISMA, um, as you look at sort of rating out to the periphery, that shows you uh, to what extent the proportion of the sample has complete reporting with the periphery being 100%. So you can see there's quite a lot of, um, bare areas here um, in terms of, yeah, like there, there are a lot of these items that just are not uh, completely reported. And perhaps this isn't surprising, given that rapid reviews tend to be inadequately reported, uh, much like um, other methodological literature and different literature types um, that's been shown. Um, there are some considerations to give me thought to when undertaking a rapid review. Um, so it, thinking about users' interest, what will meet their needs for the available time and initial sense of the volume of literature, um, allowing uh, the empirical information um, to be able to um, guide and, of course, methodological expertise to inform what approaches uh, should be using, um, facilitating that upfront conversation with the commissioner or end user to manage their expectations of the process, um, and the final uh, product output, I think, is, is really important important and whether to undertake uh, at all um, for a given topic given the particularities. Uh, and so it really is that upfront intake process that's key to setting the stage for the remainder of the work. Uh, so not only in investing the time to iteratively work through with the end user, the scope of interest, to refine that question and get it right, but to understand as you're doing some initial literature scoping, um, really what is feasible to undertake for the timeline and garnering a sense of what uh, the final report may look like to manage our expectations. Um, and further through anecdotal experience, smaller teams may be better for ensuring the consistency and nimbleness um, rather the involvement of many hands in the project. And so securing one or a small few of, of key contact people from the commissioning body can be important to ensure that the rapid review team has access to all the input um, that they need really on short notice for quick answers to keep pace with the timeline. Um, here's an example of a seven week process that we had undertaken um, and your little telephone icons show sort of the points of contact along the way that were needed by our team, um, not only to keep commissioners aware of progress, uh, but to solicit feedback to ensure that what we were producing was fit for purpose for their needs. 
Um, the look of the final report is also an important consideration. Um, and so as shown here on the screen, I've, I have a snapshot of, of one study that work that was done by Rona Mjubideep and her colleagues where uh, feedback from policymakers on items like length, so thinking about a report that's short, concise, um, and aesthetic so that, you know, they're visually pleasing images, um, it's not a crowded front page, um, can inform how you should be thinking about putting together your rapid report for the end user. And a study led by Chantal Garrity on format and packaging shows that if you look at the non-journal published rapid reviews, they can take various forms, um, with few taking on your sort of traditional MRAD journal style format and otherwise um, using other formats. Lisa Hartling and colleagues, um, they had conducted uh, interviews with key informants um, and, and of the characteristics they deemed that were critical um, for rapid reviews, um, using a reliable source to be able to conduct them was important, uh, which really underscores an opportunity here for Cochrane. And so uh, rapid reviews are one new product type being considered for producing evidence in Cochrane's strategy to 2020. As much as rapid reviews reflect uh, rapidity, this process will be anything but, and a decision to go forward will be carefully considered. Uh, briefly, to, to show you who we are as a convenership team, um, we were established as a Cochrane Methods Group in 2015, and we present a group of researchers based in Austria, the United States, and Canada. We've defined two phases to our process for the content strategy. Uh, the first phase is the background work to decide on whether Cochrane should be going forward with rapid reviews, and that's a decision that will be made by the Cochrane Governing Board forthcoming. Um, two scoping reviews, two methods projects to generate empirical evidence, and a mapping of methods to messier standards were undertaken. A consultation phase we had also planned, where we had an advisory board to be able to guide us through the process, and, um, and we also launched a survey to seek uh, input from key uh, folk within Cochrane. Um, from the first scoping review on rapid review definitions, eight themes had emerged from the literature that we had examined, uh, and input to develop a potential definition for Cochrane is underway. The second scoping review, again, showed that there were very few studies here um, that looked at very specific shortcuts to help inform um, decision making for methods for rapid reviews. And we had also mapped these to uh, key dimensions in the rapid review process. One of the methods projects um, used to help inform rapid review methods has uh, now been published in the Journal of Cl Clinical Epidemiology uh, and showed that when you uh, take a sample of, of Cochrane reviews, which is what was done, and exclude any non-English studies, um, it really had very minimal impact on the conclusions, um, anchoring the relevance of this uh, to conventional medical uh, intervention um, uh, topics. The second methods project was a randomized trial comparing single with dual uh, abstract screening uh, using Cochrane Crowd and found that a single reviewer uh, screening misses about 10% uh, of the studies. Again, a relevance to consider for the rapid review process. Uh, there are several other methods group projects completed or underway um, with our group, including looking at format, information packaging, and an extension of PRISMA for rapid reviews. And should Cochrane decide to move forward, we've outlined a second phase that includes uh, a formal development of a definition, um, circumstances under which a rapid reviews could be undertaken as part of Cochrane, development of messier standards, uh, and then other aspects relating to the production and publication of Cochrane rapid reviews. And so thinking about uh, some considerations, for example, what purposes could a Cochrane rapid review serve? Could they uh, perhaps most notably support urgent decision making for a Cochrane partner? Could they provide an interim answer um, for which is then followed up with a Cochrane review, systematic review? Uh, could they supplement an existing Cochrane uh, rapid review? So there are some uh, sample scenarios that could be considered. 
And additionally, I think it's important to think about you know, when looking at all Cochrane rapid reviews sort of forthcoming, would they be conducted with the same methods? So a one size fits all approach, or should a tailored approach uh, be taken where the time and the nature of the content area really informs what methods should then be undertaken? Thinking about you know, the Cochrane review as the gold standard, obviously in their particular area, and then what, what could we do in terms of shortcuts to then reduce bias as much as possible? when conducting a rapid review. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions uh, about rapid reviews, about our process. We would love to hear from you. Thank you.